Well, there she sits on the pad. We uh, had a, a decent lunch time, 2 o'clock in the afternoon or so. We got up and had some breakfast, and uh, the first things we had to do, obviously, was to get into our suits, get ready to go. Steve was flying for his second time into space. There's Scott, excuse me, there was Steve, Steve, Steve flying for his second time into space. And again, we can't see, there's Scott. And Pedro, notice Pedro is very serious. He was a rookie, so he was thinking about all this. And Shiaki, full of energy, she's ready to go. <laughs> Let's get out of town. And then John there, he's all pumped up. Uh, <laughs> got the suit inflated, checking the pressure check. Once that's all complete, uh, we leave the, the crew quarters there and walk out to the Astro van to make our way out to the pad. We were really overwhelmed by the number of folks that were outside. You cannot see them, but there was a huge number of folks there waiting to greet us. Now to get into the vehicle, first thing we do is show up at the white room, which you all have seen, and get on about 80 pounds more equipment, uh, our little uh, com cap and our harness, and then to get in the orbiter. As you see, the orbiter is in the vertical, so you have to, have to kind of do a chin-up to get yourself up into the seat and comfortable. Um, and then we sit there for a couple hours, uh, finishing the countdown to liftoff. There's Steve. He's uh, got his equipment now. He's in his seat on the right side. Again, you can see the vertical part of it. Shiaki's already in her seat on the mid-deck. She's nice and comfortable. Steve Robinson's getting into his seat as Ilmes number three, or Ilmes three seat. John's in the uh, white room getting his harness and stuff ready to go. And finally, Pedro getting his equipment. If you look back in the far left corner of the screen, you can see Pedro behind Steve, and then Scott getting in the center seat, kind of like the commander, bridge commander, or whatever. He's got his center seat. He can see everything. They uh, removed the white room there, and we're ready for launch. About six seconds before uh, we launch, the uh, main engines light, and they get up to speed and make sure everything's working OK. Uh, we had a little drag chute door fall off somewhere in here. You can just see in the corner. Uh, just a minor problem. but. Uh, then uh, the solid rocket boosters light off, and you really shake around in the cockpit when that happens. We'll show that here in a second, what it's like on the flight deck and the mid-deck. Uh, there's the jolt, and that's what it feels like. Uh, it's a pretty rough ride, going from 1 to 2 or 2 plus Gs almost immediately. There's the mid-deck shot. And we launch off. Uh, about the time we uh, pass the top of the tower and start turning, uh, we're already going 100, 200 miles an hour. So you get up and go real quick. We turn till we're uh, heads down, and we start heading out over the ocean. As you can see, it was just a beautiful day. There's what it looks like on the inside as we roll around and uh, start going downrange. And we'll ride these uh, solid rocket boosters up to about 150,000 feet the first two minutes of flight. Something unique on this flight, we had a camera in the left solid rocket booster that recorded the, uh, the separation there. We're looking at the external tank, and you'll see that video here in a minute. There's the, uh, the boosters coming off, and it flashes real good in the windows for us. There's the flash in the window, so you really know when they come off. And there's the shot of the orbiter flying away. And the solid rocket booster's coming off. Uh, you can see they tumble in perfect formation. You can see the Earth below. And actually, this video goes all the way down to the water. It's really spectacular to get a chance to see the whole thing. And there they are coming off from the uh, ground cameras. And then it's another six minutes, and we hit orbit uh, and uh, zero G. And there's the mid-deck when we hit zero G. And uh, uh, Steve's shaking uh, John's hand. Last thing that happens, the external tank comes off. You can see the bottom's all burned up. All in all, it was a real spectacular fun ride, and no glitches all the way up to orbit. As we get into orbit, we uh, want to photograph the external tank as it falls away. And this is what Pedro's <laughs> doing. His very first couple of minutes in space, Pedro Duque finally uh, gets into space after years of training and took this uh, beautiful camcorder shot of the tank, passing over the Earth at a tremendous velocity, and then venting out some of the excess gases. The, uh, Next thing to do is to turn this rocket ship into a orbiting laboratory. And we all got to work down on the mid-deck. John and Chiaki did a little celebrating and got right to work. They did all the work of uh, getting everybody out of their suits, packing everything up. We had about 21 bags down there. Back up on the flight deck looking aft, we uh, opened the payload bay doors so we could get to work with our payloads in the payload bay and also to uh, allow cooling for our electrical systems. If you looked right up from opening the doors, somebody pointed out uh, that we were right over the Hawaiian Islands already. We'd already gone three quarters of the way around the world, and uh, there's uh, Oahu. To give you a little tour of the payload bay, looking from uh, down from the arm, this is the aft end of the orbiter, obviously. Right up against the aft bulkhead is a collection of uh, astronomy experiments. Uh, and then right just before the Spartan satellite, there's some uh, Hubble space system uh, telescope tests that we took along with us. 
And then we took a, la a laboratory called the Space Hab on board. You're looking at it right now with the two window hatches open. And we accessed, we got into that through this tunnel from the mid-deck. And here's how, how we got in there. Go through the tunnel, floating, of course, which is a great way to travel. Into the mid-deck, or into the uh, Space Hab module, we called it. And this is our onboard laboratory, or one part of it. Actually, the whole shuttle was a laboratory. And this was actually our first time in it. And uh, I turned around and watched uh, Pedro kind of celebrating the fact that he was in the uh, microgravity or freefall environment for the first time. And he was, uh, as all of us were, having just a great time floating around and, uh, and, and also getting to work right away. Going back out to the payload bay, we're looking down from the arm again. You can see that uh, the tunnel and the airlock. Uh, we did not do an EVA on this flight, but if we did, that's where we would come out. And you can see the forward part of the orbiter there. That's the part where the crew <laughs> spends most of the time. The flight deck on top, the mid deck on the bottom. And now zooming into the flight deck here. On flight day two, uh, right after we uh, got up in orbit, we deployed the Petite Amateur Navy satellite. It's a small satellite, uh, spring-mounted, that just springs out of the, out of the, uh, the, the uh, payload bay there. The unique thing about this satellite is it's surrounded by solar panels and antennas, and it's not stabilized. So even if it spins, it still sends a good signal. It's designed for use in ham radio frequencies. So we deployed that in flight day two, and it worked quite well. Meanwhile, there were more than 80 experiments for us to work on. And on uh, the next scene, you will see John studying the bone cells of humans, trying to understand osteoporosis, or the uh, bone loss that affects um, basically uh, older people, especially women. That was one of the experiments we had in the mid-deck, or the lower part of the orbiter cabin. Through the long tunnel, as Steve said, we could uh, reach floating the other part uh, of our laboratory, our main uh, laboratory, the Space Hub module. There is where most of the science activities took place. This is a furnace in which uh, we melted uh, gradually nine different rods of very special metals. Uh, in that way, the scientists try to understand the laws of solidification in order to improve the processes, uh, uh, the industrial processes that use molten metals like casting. Another example of the very many experiments is this one, in which uh, we study the production of small quantities of a material called aerogel, which is an, a very good isolation uh, in zero G. Much of the crew time was also spent in this glove box, this box that you see sticking out the wall. Uh, one of the experiments that we performed was one in which we uh, suspended drops of liquid in mid-space and then studied their movement uh, when we applied a heater on one side of it. Uh, there were other experiments in the glove box. One of them uh, was the, this one here, in which we studied the formation of crystals in very special materials. Uh, Chiaki is in this scene trying to uh, take pictures of all these crystals before we go back to Earth, because most of those crystals will destroy once we hit uh, the Earth gravity again. So the science had to be collected right then. Some of the crystals. Uh, uh, some of the materials forming crystals might be potentially hazardous. So that's why Scott is here um, making operations inside the glove box using the gloves so, so as to keep them sealed. And this is an example of how busy the Space Hub was, a very small environment with many people doing experiments at the same time. And this is one of the examples of the facilities we had, uh, seven of them to create protein crystals. Stevie Ray and I shared the honors of flying a robotic arm on the flight. Uh, Steve was primed for the deployment and retrieval of the Spartan Solar Observing uh, Satellite. And we both flew the arm to evaluate various uh, vision systems uh, in preparation for the International Space Station assembly and beyond. And here you can see us going in for uh, the grapple of the Spartan satellite in the bay, now being carefully lifted up from its V-guides. The, uh, the arm flies incredibly well, very precise. Uh, some of the tasks on the flight required us to fly to a tolerance of less than uh, a tenth of an inch, and uh, was able to do that without uh, much difficulty at all. Prior to the deploy itself, uh, Spartan was maneuvered to evaluate the video guidance system, uh, which uh, may ultimately be used to support automated rendezvous and docking on future spacecraft. And here you can see uh, Spartan's grapple fixture pointed uh, towards the sun in anticipation of our deployment. You can also see the gold uh, mylar-covered telescope uh, of the uh, uh, Spartan uh, spacecraft. And basically, it's designed to study the solar corona, or the sun's atmosphere, 
uh, and the origins of the solar wind, basically the, the total radiation flux that we receive from the sun, because that's uh, very important in, in uh, the space um, in the uh, satellite industry, as well as for uh, space travelers, those people living on orbit and interplanetary, interplanetary travel, rather. Here we are getting ready for the deploy itself. Uh, Steve opens up the snares on the arm and very carefully backs away. And we, uh, we wait here for the next four and a half minutes. We're waiting to see a 45 degree clockwise maneuver followed by a 45 degree counterclockwise maneuver. And that indicates to the crew that uh, the Spartan is in a proper configuration for its two day free flight. Once that's complete, Kurt fires uh, thrusters on the, uh, the, sp the spacecraft, uh, the shuttle rather, and we back away from uh, Spartan for its two-day free flight. And here you can see it traveling through the end effector camera's field of view. The science team out at Goddard uh, tells us that the solar science mission aboard uh, Spartan was an unparalleled success, and they obtained hundreds of uh, solar disk images like the ones you're about to see. Tremendous images that uh, uh, will help us understand uh, the, uh, the origins of the solar wind. One of our other uh, primary objectives on this flight was to uh, gain a better understanding of some of the corollaries between space flight and the normal aging process. And here you can see John, uh, often confused for the bionic man, uh, <laughs> getting ready for sleep. And he's, he's wearing a number of uh, special scalp electrodes and an instrumented vest that uh, all told recorded 21 different physiologic parameters during his sleep and will hopefully help us understand uh, sleep shifting and, and other parameters on orbit. Uh, another major experiment was the protein turnover experiment, and here you can see Pedro backed into a corner, getting ready for another blood draw. <laughs> and uh, this uh, novel experiment will hopefully help us understand the hows and whys of uh, muscle protein buildup and breakdown. And John processed a number of the samples for us. Gravitational biology was the other field of interest. Steve is now checking the uh, signals from the fish vestibular nerve and fish behavior. And we had two fish on board. I'm giving fish an acceleration stimulus to see the response of the gravity sensing organ and its adaptation process. And also I'm watering the cucumber seeds. We had a lot of plant experiments to see how gravity affects to the plant development and growth. Steve is handling a plant fixation kit. This kit contains a liquid fixatives in it. So it has a quite a lot of capability. And I'm in the middle deck. I'm opening a portable freezer for plant samples. We also had a lot of experiments on biotechnology, such as cell culture, gene transfer, protein crystals growth, and micro uh, encapsulation, and so on. Um, as you know, uh, to keep the orbit running, you have to do a lot of operations every day. Here, Scott's changing out a lithium hydroxide canister. What this canister does is scrub the carbon dioxide out of our atmosphere each day and we have to change those out. Uh, every morning we would get up the morning mail and that would include a new flight plan with uh, change times on it. Here Kurt and I are reviewing the plan and he installs it. We had a record 20 personal computers on board for this mission to handle our science experiments, uh, a lot of our payloads and things. We use them for a lot of things. Here Pedro actually is writing a letter home. So we uh, use it for email just like you do here on Earth as well. Well, the Spartan spacecraft had been out uh, on, in the free-flying configuration for a couple days, and that was its design life, so it's now time to power the orbiter back up, get it in the configuration to rendezvous with the Spartan spacecraft. And as you see, it's a team effort. We uh, check and recheck every switch. But one of the highlights is when we get Spartan in sight for the first time, and we do that by looking out at the overhead windows, and we also have a sight that we look through to help us with ranging and angles to make sure we're flying the proper trajectory. And another thing we look for is make sure the Spartan is in the correct, or the satellite is in the correct attitude for uh, the rendezvous and grappling with the robotic arm. And again, as you can see, the hot dogs there, Spartan was in a very good attitude. Now we're looking at some monitors that we use and cameras that we use to uh, actually maneuver the orbiter manually up to the spacecraft so it's in a good position for, uh, for the grapple. And keep remembering that right now the spacecraft is stationary and the orbiter is moving ever so slightly and it weighs, so let's say, about 230, 240,000 pounds. So you're looking from the end effector of the camera and so we're moving that camera, that end effector of the arm, by maneuvering the whole orbiter. It's a very slow, very precise uh, maneuver and as you see, as we get up close to the grapple fixture or the point which I need to stop, we'll go ahead and fire the jets. The payload will stop in apparent motion right about there. That stops pretty much. And then I'll tweak it up a little bit, and I'll give it over to Steve. 
Well, it's Kurt, to put this uh, quarter million pound discovery up next to the 3,000 pound Spartan, then it was Scott and I's job to reach out with the uh, robot arm and uh, make a, uh, a good solid connection with the satellite after it had been out collecting data. Pretty important to get it back. Not only do we want it back for scientific instruments, but all the data it collected is on board, too. Uh, we uh, also use the Spartan for another reason, too, for testing construction techniques for a space station. You can see those spots on there. Those are targets for a video system which looks out and determines the uh, location and attitude of the payload to a fair, fairly uh, uh, tight degree of accuracy. And that, in fact, was used uh, just the other night to help with the first construction uh, stages of the space station. Putting it back in the payload bay was a very delicate operation, and now it's all locked back home and, and berthed, and we can bring the Spartan back home. Meanwhile, life in space goes on inside the orbiter also, and here you see Kurt uh, just put something in the oven there to warm up with the galley, just putting it in now, and then uh, we'll uh, have some food that has to be rehydrated, puts it in for either hot or cold water. If I had my bets, it probably is a shrimp cocktail if I know Kurt. And uh, there I was over in the corner eating, and you have to uh, be very carefully handle the food, put it on Velcro or uh, against uh, some of the duct tape to keep it from floating off in front of you. Uh, instead of old folks spilling things on their neckties, it came up on my, my glasses. <laughs> and uh, this is some of the hygiene going on uh, daily. Everyone, uh, close quarters we are, we expected everyone to keep clean and uh, non-smelly. Uh, that was some of the exercise uh, there. Took a towel bath after that was over, obviously. And uh, this is Shockey in one of her more somber moods, as you can see. <laughs> uh, going at it there, Miss Energy herself, nuclear energy. Someone passed her something to drink. And this is Pedro, who I think has had about enough. He's looking at his watch. He's been on it for at least a minute and a half at that point, I think. <laughs> And this was getting ready to go to bed in the sleep stations that we had for uh, three sleep stations on board because of the sleep experiment. And this is when uh, we're getting ready to go to bed one evening or get into the sleep station or not that evening and uh, shut the door. We, had some, we took some 2,500 pictures on board and uh, from the 350 uh, statute miles high that we were, they were spectacular. And we learned a lot as they, we were briefed on yesterday and uh, the uh, Picture the view from up there. Don't let anyone tell you that 28 degrees and a half inclination is bad if you can be up at 350 statute miles because uh, we had tremendous views from up there and got uh, a lot of wonderful pictures. There's a picture of a Terminator as you go from light to dark, and uh, it's very definite. The light goes down uh, over the side of the earth from there. Well, after uh, nine fun-filled days, the uh, flight director told us we had to come back. We didn't want to. Uh, here we are, we're reconfiguring the vehicle back into an uh, entry vehicle or an airplane. Meanwhile, in the mid-deck, their job is to get us all in our suits and get all the bags stowed again. Here they're instrumenting John up for one of the medical tests that's going to monitor his heart rate and blood pressure and things like that as we enter. Uh, we start our entry again about 9,000 miles away or so of the Earth. There we are all from 9,000 miles away from our landing site. There we all, all are up in the flight deck. Uh, entry was just spectacular. Uh, we flew right over Baja, California, and uh, Texas, and the uh, Gulf Coast of Florida, and then right into Florida. There you can see uh, some plasma from the heating. Uh, there's a vehicle coming in, and we'll do some roll reversals here. But if you have never been uh, across Baja, California at 40 miles in Mach 24, you just would not believe how fast you go by. It was spectacular. Um, so there we are maneuvering. We get to Florida, and uh, then we'll set up, and at about Mach 1, Kurt will take over manually and fly the orbiter to landing. Well, other than uh, fixing Senator Glenn's food, as you saw, I did have one other job, and that was landing the orbiter. <laughs> but we're coming down final here at uh, 300 knots, about 20 degree dive, and uh, uh, the next job is to put the main gear down. Steve does that about 300 feet above the ground. You notice the birds flying around. It's a bird sanctuary. and. Uh, if you notice, the orbiter has a little bit of crab in it. We had a crosswind. And you can see my hand working on the control down there, and uh, that's actually a landing. You can see what a landing looks like from inside. And right about there is a little touchdown. Another view from outside. You see the crab in the orbiter also, and down to touchdown. We touched down at 200 knots. That's about 220 or so miles an hour. We didn't have a drag chute this time, but we wouldn't use it anyway because we we're doing the crosswind DTO or crosswind test. So we flew the nose down to the runway, and. Then we started our rollout with a little bit of brakes. We'll look through the window on Steve's side, the right window. You can see uh, kind of the rollout in the orbiter. It's kind of a bumpy thing. And uh, we slowly come to a stop after four 
point, uh, action 3.6 million miles and 134 times around the Earth. Uh, STS-95 is complete. Discovery then goes back in the OPF uh, in process, and it's already in process for STS-96, which will be coming up later, uh, later on, or next year, I should say. Uh, after they check the orbiter, make sure it's all okay, the crew can get out, we get into crew transport vehicle, and then one of the neat things we like to do is walk around the orbiter, and again, just to show you how big the orbiter is compared to how big we are, and that was our home for uh, the last nine, nine days, and she did a great job uh, carrying us to uh, orbit and bringing, her, bringing us back home, and notice the nose gear is right on the center line for the landing. <laughs> but, <clears throat> and then to get in the orbiter. As you see, the orbiter is in the vertical, so you have to, have to kind of do a chin-up to get yourself up into the seat and comfortable. Um, and then we sit there for a couple hours uh, finishing the countdown to liftoff. There's Steve. He's uh, got his equipment now. He's in his seat on the right side. Again, you can see the vertical part of it. Shiaki's already in her seat on the mid-deck. She's nice and comfortable. Steve Robinson's getting into his seat as MS number three or MS three seat. John's in the uh, white room getting his harness and stuff ready to go. And finally, Pedro getting his equipment. If you look back in the far left corner of the screen, you can see Pedro behind Steve, and then Scott getting in the center seat, kind of like the commander, bridge commander or whatever. He's got his center seat. He can see everything. They uh, removed the white room there, and we're ready for launch. About six seconds before uh, we launch, the uh, main engines light and they get up to speed and make sure everything's working okay. Uh, we had a little drag chute door fall off somewhere in here. You can just see in the corner. Ready to go. <laughs> Let's get out of town. And then John there, he's all pumped up. Uh, <laughs> got the suit inflated, checking the pressure check. Once that's all complete, uh, we leave the, the crew quarters there and walk out to the Astro van to make our way out to the pad. We were really overwhelmed by the number of folks that were outside. You cannot see them, but there was a huge number of folks there waiting to greet us. Now to get into the vehicle, the first thing we do is show up at the white room, which you all have seen, and get on about 80 pounds more equipment, uh, our little uh, comm cap and our harness. Uh, just a minor problem, but uh, then uh, the solid rocket boosters light off, and you really shake around in the cockpit when that happens. We'll show that here in a second, what it's like on the flight deck and the mid deck. Uh, there's the jolt, and that's what it feels like. Uh, it's a pretty rough ride, going from one to two or two plus Gs almost immediately. There's the mid-deck shot. And we launch off. Uh, about the time we uh, pass the top of the tower and start turning, uh, we're already going 100, 200 miles an hour. So you get up and go real quick. We turn till we're uh, heads down, and we start heading out over the ocean. As you can see, it was just a beautiful day. <clears throat> well, there she sits on the pad. We uh, had a, a decent launch time, 2 o'clock in the afternoon or so. We got up and had some breakfast, and uh, the first things we had to do, obviously, was to get into our suits, get ready to go. Steve was flying for his second time into space. There's Scott, excuse me, there was Steve, Steve, Steve flying for his second time into space. And again, we can't see, there's Scott. And Pedro, notice Pedro is very serious. He was a rookie, so he was thinking about all this. And Shiaki, full of energy, she 